yeah. a very smart man. Uh, he was a very brainy man uh, uh, that was able to manoeuvre. He, he was a great leader, I think. Uh, and if, he, if, if it was nowadays, he'd be a top politician. And well, from what I've read and what I've seen and what I've heard, uh, he seems to me to be uh, a very individual uh, sort of a character, uh, a man of his own thoughts and his own ideas, uh, someone who believed that uh, politics could change the world and that people should get involved in it and agitate for the change that they were looking for. So I came to a realisation that the old lore and the old information was passing away. Yeah. And that while it had been handed down from one generation to another previously and I realised to my own children that their interests were different, they had a lot more pastimes, they had a lot more hobbies because while an awful lot is available in archival resources and through books, the old people of the countryside had a lore and a knowledge that had not been written down. The old people of the countryside, their stories were going to die with them when they passed on. Like, you know, what happened to Father O'Flanagan? What happened to Father O'Flanagan's stories? So that's one of the reasons I ended up looking into this story, because when I started to look into it, I started to wonder, where did this person go? What happened yeah. to him? Because he was so well respected and so well loved by the community, you know. Father Michael O'Flanagan was born at Kilkeveen near Castle Ray, County Roscommon. I live in Cliffley Village and we're here, we're in the old RIC barracks in Cliffany. So this building was erected around 1842. This building was built by the, the British politician Lord Palmerston was the landlord in this area, so he built all the buildings in this village. And he was born into a fairly um, staunchly Republican household. Um, his father was a member of the Fenians and um, when he was younger, he, he was born during the land wars. Yeah. Um, and 1876 actually we found was interesting. It's the year the Little Bighorn took place, but it's also the year that the six Fenian prisoners escaped. Oh, they must have. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So he was born kind of in the heights of all of that activity. And I do know that the house, um, there were, would have been big fans of Wolf Tone and Robert Emmett. I think they had prints on the walls and all that. So we had a vocation. It's, it's something I suppose we don't really understand anymore today. Yeah. Like, you have gone with the church. He seems to have had a very um, definite vocation. So he went to Summerhill in Sligo. And from there he went to Maynooth and he was trained as a priest. And he was ordained in 1900. He studied in St. Patrick's Maynooth and was a brilliant student winning prizes in theology, Irish language, and natural science. It seems to have been in a class of priests in Maynooth who all had similar interests. And he seems to, you pick up a sense that he, they had some kind of agreement between them and yeah. they, had gone to, they were going to go on a certain path. He was ordained on the 15th of August 1900 for the Diocese of Elphin. He was Professor of Irish at Summerhill College until 1904. He became enthused for the Gaelic Revival. His organisation of the Sligo Fesh brought him to the attention of Sinn Féin. He was Irish teacher in Summerhill for four years and then they sent him off to America to raise money, to fundraise. He was sent by Bishop John Joseph Clancy and Horace Plunkett to speak in the United States to find investment for agricultural and industrial projects in the west of Ireland. And the church had bought a building in Loch Lynn. They had bought the old um, Dillon estate in Loch Lynn and turned it into a kind of cottage industry. There were uh, cheese and dairy um, produce being made there. So it sent Father Flanagan to America to raise money to pay off for these buildings. So while he was in America, it turned out he had a flair for fundraising, but also while he was in America, he toured America for about five years, I think, maybe mm. from 1904 to 1909. And while he was over there, he associated with preachers or he studied great preachers or orators yeah. and um, he picked up a lot of tips and tricks about putting stories in newspapers and different things. 
they say that he became a great public speaker in America and traveling across America. In 1910, he was elected to the executive of the Gaelic League with Fionan McCollum. He came back in 1910 and uh, uh, straight away he was um, he, he was working for the Gaelic League this time and he was again headhunted by the Gaelic League to go back to America to fundraise. So he came home in 1910 and I think he was only home for a few months and he was Ooh. sent back to America again. This time he was sent back with the, ble well again, he was sent back with the blessing of the bishop. Now seemingly they didn't raise a huge amount of money. Yet. He had been stationed in Roscommon. Um, when he came back from America, he was stationed in Roscommon Town and in Roscommon Cathedral. He was appointed curate in Roscommon in 1912 by Bishop John Joseph Clancy, whose political sympathies he shared. And he was based in the, the, the um, presbytery, which is just uh, the old presbytery, which is now a family life centre. It's just outside the gates of Roscommon Cathedral. Clancy died that year and his successor, Bernard Coyne, was a conservative who frowned on O'Flanagan's modernism. The young priest had been outspoken on rural development and Irish self-reliance. O'Flanagan realised his ecclesiastical prospects were dim, so he focused on his political activity. In 1913, he was elected to Standing Committee of the Gaelic League. He was sent to Italy to advocate for Irish independence in Rome. His oratorical skills were recognised because he was twice chosen to be the Advent preacher in St. Sylvester's in Rome. And he seems to have had a row with Canon Commons and it's mentioned in his, in his autobiography yeah. that um, the bishop mentions that he was actually bombarded by letters from his previous um, uh, priest who would be Canon Commons to have him moved to Cliffany so he, it, it's a little bit like when you look at Father Ted that yeah. notion about taking troublesome priests mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. just obviously based on something that actually happened. On the 1st of August Coyne transferred him to Cliffany and the Grange Parish in North County Sligo. According to Patrick McCannon's witness statement early in the year 1914 Cliffany and its surroundings was awakened from its slumberings by the arrival in the village of that great priest and patriot, the never to be forgotten Reverend Father Michael O'Flanagan. His eloquent address and manly bearing had an inspiring effect. He went amongst the people, sympathising in their sorrows and making himself acquainted with their difficulties and trials. Soon he discovered their steadfast loyalty to their faith but humble submission to landlord and alien rule. And the canon there was Canon Cummins who was actually from Cliffany here mm. and Canon Cummins' brother ran the hotel just across the road. That's right. one of the reasons Father O'Flanagan didn't want to go and stay in that hotel right. because he, as he mentions himself, he had already had, he had issues with the brother of that yeah. person so he wasn't going to go there. That's why he moved to Mullockmore when he came here, he did his own thing. for a swim. He, used to, he talks about it in his memoir about marching down to the pier every night. Yeah. What happened here was <coughs> we're, we're on the old Palmerston estate here, so we're yeah. on a, a, it's a, a fairly substantial landlord's estate. So by the time Father of Lanning had arrived here in 1914, the district, the Wyndham Act had been put through, so the large estates were being broken up and the land was being redistributed back. Mm. So the land has been squared, so you're here now, this yeah. is the cottage. On the 1911 map, and this is the cottage on the 1837 map. About 10 years before the famine, you see all these different plots of land here. Yeah. But there were tenants living here, so they were cleared off. Mm -hmm. The field is empty here now. Mm -hmm. 
Well, when Father O'Flanagan was sent to Cliffany originally in 1914, he thought about moving into the hotel up in the village, but he decided not to move in there. He ended up moving to a lodge in Willockmoor um, for various reasons. But eventually this place, Mrs. Hannan's Cottage, came available to rent. And the local doctor had been staying here. The doctor moved on to another part of the country and Father O'Flanagan took over the lease of Mrs. Hannan's cottage. So her son, Tom Hannan, had gone off. He had enlisted in the British Army to go and fight in World War I. And Mrs. Hannan herself lived next door. And this cottage here is actually where... Good morning, good morning, yeah. Yeah. This is where the Clinarco bog protest really starts, I suppose, because Mrs. Hannan asks Father O'Flanagan while he is staying here, she asks if maybe he could contact the Congested Districts Board and see about getting a bank of turf to go with this cottage. Oh, because her son has basically gone to fight for the British Army. He deserves some kind of a reward for it. Sure. So, but the bogs of Cliffany had been divided. The land was all being sold by the Land Commission and the Congested Districts oh. Board. And as with everything else, I think there was different groups, there was different people with different vested interests. Mm. And it all came into play. So the land was being divided unfairly. So some people were getting access to the bogs, which we'll go up and visit now shortly. Mm. And some people were being denied access to the bogs. Okay. So, for example, where we're going up to now, the people from Inish Murray Island, which is about eight, eight miles away and about five miles across the sea, mm. they had rights to cut turf up here, where the people who lived in Cliffany next door oh, had no rights to yeah. cut turf here. Oh, very good. Very and they had an ancestral claim on this bog going back hundreds of years there was a huge bog all behind us here when Lord Palmerston inherited this area he mentions it and I think um, it was all sand on one side and it was all bog on the other side and it was a road running straight through okay. was what he inherited you know so there's a huge bog up here it's been largely worked out now but when you drive through it you can actually see that sometimes you're on causeways and that means that the land beside you has all been made the fields have all been formed from bog that was cut away sure Father Fannigan lived here in this cottage for a year Anyway, his views on World War One. He was very anti um, World War One. He reckoned it was a war um, which was about coal mines and oil fields. It was about resources. It wasn't about people. And there was a famous quote he made in one of his speeches where he said that while well, the flower of Europe, the, the youth of Europe, were being their graves, that the, the British and the German cousins would end up chinking champagne glasses over the bodies of the dead, which it did actually did happen yeah. at the end of World War One. actually, the, um, the Germans and uh, the British made up and... Well, he was fairly radical, um, he didn't trust the English government remotely, and um, as he said himself, they had an old game, John Poole had an old game of kind of like painting um, the enemy, of, of kind of calumny, cal calumnating I suppose was the word he used a lot. Mm -hmm. So he reckoned that if the British were kind of standing up, beating their chests or brow beating about something, yeah. that uh, the other person was probably in the right. He, he just didn't trust the British at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he did his best here with the people in Clifford to try and ensure that none of them went and enrolled in the army. Father O'Flanagan has said, I realised fully, for the first time, the horror of the action of Cardinal Logue and those other bishops and leaders of the Irish party who allowed their names to be plastered up on the recruiting posters all over the country as a means of inducing the poor, innocent, enthusiastic Catholic boys of Ireland to deliver their very lives into the hands of hypocrites who guided England's war machine. <laughs> Most people around here would have been very united against landlordism yeah. and um, the English, the captivity in which we were held by the English at the time. Sure. Most people would be opposed to that. Some people may, indeed, as it happens today, would have been militant, yeah. and others uh, um, wouldn't uh, agree with the violent uh, conclusions of the problem or anything like that.
in such a dramatic landscape. That's gorgeous. So this is Ben Wiskin Mountain. And this over here is Thief Vaughan and Trusk Moor. And then you can see Ben Bulbin over here in the distance. Yeah, the parish of uh, Cliffany would uh, most likely remember Father Michael O'Flanagan more than anyone else and in more detail than anyone else. And in particular because of the battle uh, that he was involved in on a bog called Cluner Coo Bog, uh, there was a government agency called the Congested District Boards. Uh, its job was to allocate, allocate uh, turf banks to uh, the people of the area. Uh, around the time of the start of the war in 1914, the congested district boards decided to stop local people cutting turf there and to continue to let the important people and the dignitaries to cut the turf there. So Father Michael O'Flanagan uh, decided he didn't want this to happen. He opposed it and from the pulpit in uh, June 1914, when it was getting late uh, to cut the turf, it was the last opportunity the people of the area would have had to save the fuel for the year. He got up and he told people to go out and get their turf turf spades or their shlanes as we call them now and that he would go out and cut the turf with them too. Father O'Flanagan took on the establishment against the wishes of Bishop Coyne when he agitated for turbary rights, the right to cut turf for the local people. June 29th 1915 Father O'Flanagan asked his parishioners to remain after 12.30 Mass. Sergeant Perry of the RIC also remained to note what the priest had to say. The priest said people were sick of keeping quiet in the hope that when the war was over, home rule would be given. I would advise every man and boy who wants a turf bank and can work a spade to go to the waste bog tomorrow and cut plenty of turf. He remarked that people should not have their children shivering for want of a fire. On Wednesday 30th, the people were to assemble at the priest's home and march to the bog. Barry, another police spy, said a notice was pinned to a tree in the chapel grounds which read, If you want turf, start cutting at once. You will get lots of good example tomorrow. Let every man able to handle a spade be there. No admission charge to spectators. 200 people led by Father O'Flanagan and Dr. John Nally cut three trenches of up to 12,000 cubic feet of turf. The turf was banked and distributed close to the RIC barracks. So what happened with Father O'Flanagan was, um, when he moved down to the cottage down at Mrs. Hannan's, mm. um, Mrs. Hannan approached him to know if she would help him to get some turbary rights to go with her cottage for her son Tom. So Tom had enlisted to go off and fight in World War One in the British Army. So he was away off in Flanders or somewhere. And Father Flanagan was in what they call Tom Hannan's cottage. Sure. So she had kept that cottage for her son Tom. So apparently he came back very damaged from the war, so I believe. Anyway, um, so Father Flanagan approached the congested districts board and he talked to them about getting rights for the tenants in Cliffany when the land was divided up and sold. The congested district board had acquired the Hipsley and Sullivan estate. They were insisting on redistributing turf cutting rights to families who had relatives in the British Army or RIC. Yeah. But the, the break up of the estates here, like the classic bond estate was being broken up. Okay. So parcels of the land were being sold and distributed through different kind of auctioneers and groups. Yeah. So they talk about a Hipsley, or a Hipsley Sullivan estate and they talk about the classic bond estate. And I, I think there were two parcels of land here, two seconds of bog. And the local people in Cliffany basically had no right to come up here and cut turf. Mm. But they had already always had ancestral rights. So once the land was sold, suddenly their rights were gone. So Father Flanagan found that the Congested Districts Board, pretty much like NAMA of um, today, he found that they were doing nothing for the people that they were supposed to be helping. Mm. They actually weren't helping the poor people, the rank and file of the people, as he would call it. So he found that, that um, he tried, he sent several letters to the Congested Districts Board to try and get the issue resolved and nothing happened. So eventually at the end of June on 1915, um, he won Sunday after Mass, he said to the local people that they should assemble the next morning outside the church and bring their weapons of turf cutting, mm. mass, 
and he led a march up to the bog and they were followed by the police because I mean you can see yourself the church is right beside the barracks absolutely yeah so I mean it was kind of obvious what was happening and they come up to the empty bog which is a little bit further up here just yeah <laughs> to try and give people courage, to try and let people know that this path had been trodden before and he showed the way. And we could tell people that if they were to fight to keep their bogs, that, well, you're not the first to do it. And it has been done before. And the good news we could tell people because of Father Michael O'Flanagan was that not only did he fight, not only did he take on the powers that be, but we were able to tell them that he won. And because we were able to tell them that he won, they got the confidence to do what they needed to do. And that fight continues today. And one of the main reasons why we can do it is because this man led the way. He used a statement, we have been quiet for too long. We have been lied to for too long. I think we should definitely remember his words today. And we should remember his words when we show solidarity as he did with the people here in Tiffany. And we hope to win. But either way, we will continue to cut our turf in the same way as my Father Michael O'Flanagan did. We will show no fear. And some people say we will show that we have backbone. And that is exactly what we've got to do. And our day will come, definitely. Thank you. And apparently he cut the first few sods of turf to show that he wasn't going to be um, daunted by the police. And that was it, they said too. So uh, over a couple of days or a couple of sessions, they caught a huge amount of turf. Three long trenches, he talks about. And uh, a very shrewd man as well. Uh, when he led the people up there, part of the reason was he cut the first turf. And the reason he would have done that is because the, the authorities would be very hesitant to arrest a priest because yes. that would enrage the populace. They cured it. And the two policemen used to come up and stand and talk chat to the men who were saving the turf yeah. and eventually it was saved and um, they gathered it and they brought it down and they stacked it in the village okay. outside the hall right. they put a tricolour on it oh really and again in 1915 this was outside the barracks and the tricolour had a banner saying our, our own turf yeah and our own fane and it was on the side of the main road and every time the banner was taken down it would get replaced again they cut enough for themselves and they cut enough for the old people and the people who weren't able to cut and the, 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 the surplus of the turf that were cut and saved uh, were brought down to Cliffney and built in a stack. Uh, World War I had broken out while he was here, just when he arrived here. Um, there were fuel shortages. He talked about how the police were going around inciting fear of a German invasion into people, telling people basically that the Germans were going to invade on the west coast of Ireland and um, there's actually a few records of sermons of his from, from policemen. Policemen, this is where the people um, in an act of social defiance, they come up here and they cut turf in an, there was an unresolved dispute and I think there was injunctions sent down from Dublin Castle, there was, there was telegrams, um, legal documents sent to Father Flanagan, he ignored them and I think they were all fined and I think he took responsibility for the action, I think there were six men involved. <laughs> Father Michael 
said, explaining the difficulties, and of course Ireland was in captivity at that time. He said, if you gently grasp a nettle, it will sting you for your pain. Grasp it like a lad of metal, and it will as soft as silk remain. <laughs> <laughs> well, the big one, of course, is the, is the Cliffney Bog fight, mm. where he uh, assembled the people after mass and led them up to the bogs. That's that's a story. That's a big story around here. It's still a big story around here. Uh, he did that uh, with uh, members of uh, the police forces there and members of the state. They saved the turf. They brought it home, and people heated their houses that year. They cooked their food, and uh, they lived because of what he did. So I think the people of Cliffany will forever think of him as a great man. Mm. It was that much of that much importance. Uh, at the time, mm. no gas and there was no electricity. That, when 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 that happened, uh, the people ended up having two enemies. Mm. They had the British enemy and the police that was in this based in this house here, mm -hmm. and. The, had the bishop that was supposed to be standing up for for them, and and uh, he he turned against fellow Flanagan, and so did the police, and uh, between the two of them, the the they moved them out of Clippany, which was a terrible, uh, sad uh, event in the views of the people in Clippany. And in particular, what they did after Father Michael O'Flanagan was removed from the parish by uh, Dr. Coyne, the bishop in the area. Uh, at the time, uh, people obviously would have feared the church because they had massive power. They had power over whether you'd have got a house, whether you'd have got a job, and whether you'd be able to stay in the area. But in spite of that, the people of Cliffany, and this will tell you exactly what they thought of them, they boarded up that church. They didn't let anyone else say mass there uh, for weeks weeks until Father Michael O'Flanagan gave them permission to let another priest into the area. So the question is, what do the people of Cliffany think of him and what do they think of him to this day? They love him and they revere him. What was the reaction to him being moved? Do you know? Well, before he was moved, uh, he, 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 got, he was unnoticed to be, that he was going to be moved. And a deputation of people walked, some of them in their bare feet, would have been at the, uh, normal at the time, yeah. walked to slide with the bishop's palace. And some of them went on donkeys and carts and whichever way they, they were able to get there, mm. they all went uh, uh, as a deputation to the bishop for to see would he change his mind and he wouldn't meet them. Uh, one time, he, he, they went twice actually. Uh, one of the times he, he claimed he was gone on holidays. Several attempts for to try and get the bishop to change his mind to get him back to Cliffany here, but it failed. And one of the things uh, that you would have, everybody knows it in the area, that would like to talk about it, some doesn't want to talk about mm. it. And uh, you can imagine what side they were on that time, and they're still to, to be had in Cliffany, yeah. their descendants. Yeah. But um, the only thing that they had uh, uh, that could uh, have a repercussion on was that they closed the chapel. Okay. The, the, the people gathered and said the rosary outside the locked door of the chapel, mm. and mm. and the chapel was closed for was closed for almost three months until Pedro Flanagan sent word to them that he wasn't going to get back to them, and he didn't want the people of Cliffany being without um, mass on a Christmas morning. Okay. So he asked them for to open the church up. Sure. And give up the give up the protest. Mm. So that that's that's how it how it it, it fizzled out at that end. <coughs> but in October of nineteen fifteen, <coughs> the minister for agriculture or the junior minister for agriculture, I think um, T W Russell, came to Sligo, and he was on a rally around the country. 
and he was talking to community groups and farming groups and mm -hmm. he was encouraging them to increase, increase their output of produce of wheat and of other resources for World War I. It was basically to, to grow more food for the war effort. Sure. <clears throat> so he gave a talk to a um, group, I suppose, to, to, to leaders, community leaders in, in the town hall in Sligo. And the talk was chaired by um, Canon Dooley, who was the second in command, I suppose, in, in the Catholic hierarchy in Sligo. So Father Flanagan arrived in with a crew of his people from Cliffney. And they were going to kind of, they say it in, in this memoir, they were going to have a kind of demonstration when they came into town, but they thought the better of it. They were going to march up to the Bishop's Palace with all this turf and stack the turf, right. distributed to the needy people of Sligo or whatever. Okay. But um, they thought they would run into trouble with the separation women. They mentioned gotcha. that, that Sligo was a garrison town, yeah. so there was a lot of widows or women there who were being paid mm. by the British state, so they, they felt that there would be a scene. So they went in. And he attended the meeting in the courthouse where Russell was. And anyway, at the end of the meeting, he stood up to make some points to Minister Russell. And it turned into a slagging match, basically. Okay. And um, because he'd gotten a bit of notoriety for the, the carry-on up here in the bog in Cliffney, okay. that had got into quite a few newspapers. Okay. Uh, because they had their stack of turf by the side of the main road. Yeah. Lots of people saw it with their banner and that. So okay. they, uh, Minister Russell accused him and the people of Cliffney of play-acting up in the bog. Okay. Um, Father of Hannigan said it was the politicians who were the ones who really knew how to play act. You know, it turned into a bit of a kind of a personal slagging match. Which he said to, he said to Sean O'Casey, reckoned he was one of the three best open air speakers. Nice. Uh, himself and Larkin. And the other thing that he did was he said okay. uh, um, we needed um, to actually put aside several million acres of land and that we needed to start growing crops properly on an industrial scale and that there would have been no famine in Ireland. This was the cruncher, I suppose. He, stood, he said that if if Irish people had held on to their produce back in uh, 1847, there would have been no famine in Ireland. Mm. And it's the fact that people actually went and paid their rent and were subservient to the landlords and didn't stand up and have more spine. Mm. This was the, the issue at this speech he made up and he stood up and he made the speech that uh, basically we should have stood up to the British at the time of the famine and we should certainly be standing up to them now and that we should be holding on to our own produce and our own farms and feeding our own people. <coughs> and that if famine came in England, that um, the English would look after themselves, they wouldn't look after the Irish. They proved this before, he was saying. Yeah. So basically he said at this time, stick to the oaths. You know, yeah. I think every place he went, he, he encouraged people to stand up for their rights. Like, you know. hey, what do you think about the church's attempts to, uh, to shut him up to silence for their family? Well, uh, the church uh, attempted to silence Father Flanagan as it tends to do when someone takes on the establishment, when someone takes on uh, people who may potentially provide money to the church. So I think his attempts, even nowadays, would be very brave from a priest. But back then, when you had people like Ar Archbishop in charge, when you had a church that could come down on you like a ton of bricks, as I said earlier, they could deny you a house, they could deny you fuel, they could deny you a job and they could pretty much deny your right to live in that area. I think it's very significant what Father Michael O'Flanagan did. To take on the church at the time was a massively brave thing to do. Uh, people would say that he must have been a little bit crazy to do it, but uh, maybe you need a little bit of that in you to take on the establishment. So from that point of view, I think what he did was immense. But also, Without the people standing by him, he wouldn't have been able to do this. And I think if you look at the time that people actually boarded up a church in Ireland, when they would have been normally terrified of the church, says something about them, but it also says, and it says something massive about Father Michael O'Flanagan, that he would inspire that courage, would inspire that belief, and inspire the idea that people have self-determination. So um, him taking on the church was a massive thing to do. I wish we had more like him nowadays. While Father O'Flanagan was in Krosna, he was becoming increasingly in demand as a speaker at nationalist gatherings. His speech at the lying in state of O'Donovan Rossa in Dublin rivaled in eloquence that delivered at the graveside by Patrick Pierce the following day. When he was in America before, he had become a close friend of the Rossa family and he accompanied the family to Glasnevin and officiated at the graveside. In November of 1915, he also delivered an oration at the Manchester Martyrs' commemoration at Belfast. 
This is meant to have been one of the greatest nationalist demonstrations in living memory. And Mary Jane and Donovan Ross, they actually, they, they, they asked Father Flanagan to be the priest. And again, he would have been probably fairly well known. He had visited Donovan Rossa in, in America. Again, okay. and come across that. He had gone to visit him in yeah. New York. And again, from the background he came with, these people would have been huge heroes. Yeah. And he said it, I mean, that he, more or less in his speech up in Dublin, you know, Donovan Rossa was a huge hero in his family, in his household, yeah. and a huge inspiration to Irish people, his resistance. And then he was asked to make a speech, and apparently in Kathleen Clark's memoirs, they said it was a toss of the coin, actually. It was either going to be Father Flanagan or Pierce at the gravesite. But they decided to get Father Flanagan. He made the speech in City Hall. Love of country, above all things, means love of its people. It means love of the people of Ireland, not merely as men and women, but as Irish men and women. Hence there comes with the love we bear, the people of Ireland. Growing out of that love, a hatred of anything that would destroy our distinctive civilization, and which would tell us to remember everything outside of Ireland, but to forget the things that are within Ireland. In 1917, the Roscommon election proved to be the first blow. Count Plunkett had suffered the indignity of having his name removed from the membership role of the Royal Dublin Society. The reason given was because his son, Joseph Plunkett, took a leading part in the Rising. Joseph Plunkett had been murdered along with the other 1916 leaders. Nationalists had decided to put up a candidate to contest Roscommon against the Redmanites. Count Plunkett was chosen. Father O'Flanagan was crucial in organising that campaign and was one of the reasons for Plunkett's overwhelming victory. Father O'Flanagan had stated his policy was to proclaim that the freedom to be accorded to Ireland must be the same as that of Belgium, Serbia, Bohemia, Romania, France and Germany. The campaign that took place was in one of the coldest, bitterest winter spells of the 20th century. Arthur Griffith, who was just out of jail, had offered £150 which he had obtained to restart nationality. His offer was not accepted and Father O'Flanagan managed to borrow £400 which was painfully paid back the following year. By refusing Arthur Griffith's offer, Father O'Flanagan proclaimed himself a man of the left wing in Republican politics. It should be remembered that Arthur Griffith had formed Sinn Féin and Father O'Flanagan had a close-up insight into Arthur Griffith's character. Five years later, Arthur Griffith would sign the treaty. I think it was after the Camp Plunkett Convention, um, Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith got into a huge row um, in Harcourt Street, I think it was, and mm. Father O'Flanagan actually had to separate the two of them. Oh, yeah. And that's, that's in 1917. Right. And that's really interesting when you think about Collins and, and how they got Griffith together. Going yeah. off. Yeah. to work on the treaty together and then having their disagreements and agreements. You know? Yeah. So Father Flanagan knew all these people very, very well. Like, you know, he was okay. 
he was on all these different committees with them, so he spent a lot of time working with them, you know. Arthur Griffith's vision of Sinn Féin had favoured a dual monarchy and newly released Republicans who had taken part in 1916 wanted complete independence. Arthur Griffith had refused to accept the amalgamation of his non-Republican Sinn Féin party with the Republican Liberty Clubs unless the new organisation accepted the name of Sinn Féin. Father O'Flanagan, who became vice chairman, complained bitterly of Arthur Griffith's high-handed behaviour. He added that the split in the national camp, which became clear in 1922, was there all the time. He argued that people with different policies were trying to work within one party, rather than having two separate parties which could cooperate on matters of mutual interest. God save Ireland from conscription God save Ireland, say us all And united we will stand for our fate and fatherland Pledging freedom's fight the conqueror to fall In May 1918, Father O'Flanagan made a speech to over 10,000 people in the small town of Bally James Duff. The speech had to be printed privately as a pamphlet, as the censor forbade the publication of even a single word of it in the press. But the quarrel between Ireland and England will go on until Ireland is completely separated from England under that beautiful tricolour flag of the Irish Republic. All this hatred is largely a manufactured hatred that is built up by the lying newspapers and lying ministers who sit in offices in London and other capitals of Europe and play with the lives of men by the million. With a stroke of a pencil or with some wild speech or some wild sentence about a knockout blow, they blot out the lives of hundreds of thousands of fathers and children and leave weeping and broken hearts throughout the length and breadth of Europe. Thank God there is one nation in Europe that has got leaders who are not sitting at home but who are encountering as much danger as the rank and file of their followers, who have not translated the world into terms of machine guns, poison gas and high explosives. Father O'Flanagan was Vice President of Sinn Féin in 1917 but became Acting President of Sinn Féin between 1918 to 1919 as a result of the arrest of the Sinn Féin leaders. During the election at the end of 1918, Father O'Flanagan addressed 100,000 people in an eve of poll meeting in O'Connell Street. Sinn Féin had called for separation. The elections, and, and they're all elected like Mark and mm. Griffith, they're all, you know, become mm. MPs and um, none of them take their places. They, they, the whole Sinn Féin policy of abstentionism is put into practice. Yeah. Um, so he had a car supply. Basically, he was their best public speaker. He wasn't locked up, so he was actually sent canvassing. He regularly spoke at um, half a dozen rallies around the country a day. And the Sinn Féin MPs refused to attend Westminster and set up Dáil Éireann, which opened at the Mansion House in Dublin on January 21st, 1919. At that time, Father Flanagan, when he went and spoke in Cavan yeah. um, for Arthur Griffith, again, he was suspended by the bishop. He was dismissed from being a priest. So again, we have copies of all of these letters. And which bishop was this again? This is Bishop Coyne again. Again. The bishop of Belgium. Okay. So he penalises Father O'Flanagan, he, um, he's not allowed to say Mass or to speak to yeah. the public. And as he says, he's not allowed to harangue people off the altar. Right. I withdraw from you permission to preach anywhere in this diocese 
also to celebrate Mass outside the parish. I must forbid you to deliver any public lecture or address or to remain a night outside the parish. I remain your grieved and afflicted bishop, signed Bernard Coyne. Um, so Father Flanagan moves to Dublin at this stage and he ends up actually sleeping on couches or he spends a lot of, at that stage in May of 1918 after the German plot he more or less is running Sinn Féin because the rest of them are in prison. At this stage Father O'Flanagan had been silenced by his bishop. However, he was invited to say prayers with which the first doll was opened. Father Michael O'Flanagan said a prayer to bless the first doll. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, his first prayer to the doll uh, was uh, very significant as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the importance of the type of prayer that he said is, is, is the thing here. It was neither a Catholic nor a Protestant prayer. It was across the board. He respect all aspects of the Christian faith and he wanted to do this in order to encourage a united Ireland by making the Protestant community feel more comfortable in coming into this state. And the relevance to my political life is very strong because actually when I became mayor of County Roscommon in 2011 I was faced with the situation whereby I would have to say the prayer at the start of that council meeting and given that I'm an atheist and I don't believe in God I refused to say that prayer and it was said to me at that meeting that I was not respecting tradition and the great irony was it was the prayer the same prayer that was said in the first stall by Father Michael O'Flanagan and the irony for me was that as an atheist I was now being forced to say this prayer even though the prayer was composed in the first place to respect the will and the beliefs of all people and as it turns out I wasn't actually doing anything against history at that council meeting because I was told that at the very first council meeting this prayer was said it actually wasn't at the very first council meeting they stood and they swore allegiance to the Queen so historically him saying that prayer and speaking for the first time in the Dáil had major significance with me. They called it Prayer Gate in Roscommon County Council. And there's a man called J.J. O'Connor who is a member of the Turf Cutters and Contractors Association. And with the first time he mentioned Father Michael O'Flanagan to me, he used the phrase, it's like history coming around to sting itself in the arse. Well, on several occasions it stung itself in the arse on this issue for me. Father O'Flanagan had become a judge in the Republican courts which were set up. The British government in response had flooded the country with troops. These troops were put into a mixture of police and khaki uniforms, otherwise known as the Black and Tans. So you, you briefly mentioned about him uh, having a revolver. I, I presume his life was under threat or in danger. This is not an easy time. Yeah, he was, he was threatened by the auxiliaries, like they raided his flats in Roscommon in 1920. Anyway, so the, the country was in, in an extremely, it was like a pressure cooker, really, mm. at that particular point. And then you had um, <coughs> Terence McSweeney was on his hunger strike. Mm. And um, so actually on the day of the Terence McSweeney died, and apparently the sergeant here in the barracks, um, who was shot at uh, shortly afterwards, Apparently, one of the things he used to do was go around to local republics and say, "Hungry bastard, dead yet." He used to right. the hungry bastard. Right. Mm. <coughs> so on, on the day that Terence McSweeney died, uh, there was an ambush arranged by the local IRA here. So we're in the barracks here now. So there's nine man patrol set off on bicycle from here. They were heading to Maharao to a pub called Jordan's, where somebody had cut the shafts off the the pony cart, and the man running the pub had reported this crime to the police so they were being sent a patrol was being sent over to investigate mm. it was all a set up the yes. IRA had dissolved the shafts of the cart so about two and a half miles down the road they were passing a Hamlet cemetery and they were ambushed by about a 30 man IRA patrol so four of the policemen were killed in the ambush mm. and about I think it's about 10 days later as a reprising a group of auxiliaries who were stationed in South Sligo came up <coughs> and uh, they burnt seven houses of some of the leading Republicans around here and they also set fire to the hall, the Father of Lannigan Hall 
was what it was called at the time. I think it was named that. Yeah. And they dropped graffiti on it. Like the, the auxiliaries, when they came, they bought a can of paint with them and they bought petrol. So that's what they did around here. They often poured petrol and things. They didn't always set them on fire. And again, it was all psychological. Then people were afraid to come in and light a fire or do anything in the yeah. house or cook anything in case. A Stephen Cottage just got burnt during that reprisal raid. And three American gentlemen were sent over as independent observers because there were lots of atrocities mm. taking place in the country. There were lots of, you know, random shootings by the black and tans and things. Mm. Father Flanagan actually wrote an essay. It was in his, his private papers about the state of lawlessness in the country and the state of reprisals. And also the fact that, um, like, the Republican courts were going on at the time. And again, he was a juror. Yeah. I think he, he actually worked mm. on the Republican mm. courts. He was involved in all aspects of, um, as he said himself, the two governments that were in the country. So he was he was in the executive of Sinn Féin. So again, while people were in prison, he was involved in the Republican courts, in the land redistribution, in the creameries. He was involved in all these different the agricultural side of things. And De Valera, when he was on his tour in the States, Harry Boland arranged for his wife to be brought over to him. Yeah. And she was Sinead, Sinead Lee Flanagan. Yeah. And um, his wife, right? Okay. De Valera's wife, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, De Valera was sent a telegram anyway, Flanagan here, yeah. And he it was cold, and his own wife was there, but okay. he thought that they'd send Father of Flanagan over, and he was going, Oh my god, he was apparently saying, How am I going to handle him, you know, right? Keep him in so, right. they all, you know, they, they couldn't really contain him, okay. Michael Collins used to call him Father Mick, and he okay. used to say to him, that, uh, He used to say, Well, I suppose Father Mick thinks he's the only one who can organize anything or can cope with anything. Like, in late 1920, some Sinn Féin politicians were disturbed by the violence of the IRA's military campaign. Lloyd George had stated that negotiations could begin as soon as the IRA declared a ceasefire. From Roscommon, he wrote a telegram to Lloyd George. Mm. And Lloyd George was kind of mouthing off, I suppose, in the news. He was kind of making sounds about peace, peace moves. Mm. So Father O'Flanagan kind of confronted him. He said, "You is something like um, you say, you you're interested in peace. Well, Ireland is too is interested in peace, and let's have it out now. We don't have to wait till Christmas to have peace on the table." So he was making some kind of talk in 1920 about peace for Christmas or something. Hmm. Father O'Flanagan was acting president of Sinn Fein. He sent a telegram to Lloyd George seeking terms. He said. You state you are willing to make peace at once without waiting till Christmas. Ireland is also willing to make peace. What first step do you propose? O'Flanagan was acting on his own and he had his own moral reservations about the IRA's military campaign. O'Flanagan was one of the few Republican separatists who was willing to go for partition. He believed the Ulster Unionists had excluded themselves from the Irish nation and Republicans could not force Antrim and Down to love us by force. He felt it would be hypocritical for Sinn Féin to condemn British coercion of Ireland while Ireland attempted to coerce the Unionists of Ulster. O'Flanagan was also considering a political settlement based on dominion status. Yeah. And around that time there was a few threats made in his life. He got a few letters which were anonymous, which were saying that um, a bullet would be just about good enough for him. So Father O'Flanagan took him on and asked him what exactly did he mean. So they initiated a correspondence through the newspapers. Right. So Father O'Flanagan would send Lloyd George a telegram and Lloyd George would respond. And it was all documented in the newspapers. The British had believed that O'Flanagan had spoke with full authority and power to negotiate as an official representative of the Republican leadership. In early 1921, Lloyd George had said that O'Flanagan represented nobody but himself and that he must deal with someone who could deliver the goods. Michael Collins didn't appreciate O'Flanagan trying to secure an IRA ceasefire. He condemned O'Flanagan. He said, We must not allow ourselves to be rushed by these foolish productions or foolish people who are tumbling over themselves to talk about a truce when there is no truce. That the priest meddling prevented the political settlement being reached. 
the, the, the leaders of Sinn Féin were horrified. Like De Valera was in the States, Griffith was in prison. Collins was outraged because Collins was, at the, that time, he actually had his own secret set of yeah. peace moves going on and negotiations through Archbishop Clune and um, Collins met with Clune around that time. So Father O'Hannigan kind of wrecked it. Okay. But he also showed the British government that the, the leaders of Sinn Féin weren't all of one mind or singing off the same hymn sheet. Okay, yeah. So the British actually took this as a sign that the Irish leaders weren't unified and they actually talked about peace but they intensified. So that's when you get the burning of Cork and, and yeah. Balbriggan comes along. Well, some people did say that Father Flanagan actually made, it was like throwing Petron onto a fire basically maybe okay. by his doing what he did. But he said himself again, he, as he mentioned there, tearing aside the mask of hypocrisy. Yeah. One of the things you heard, you would hear him say that regularly enough. So yeah. he felt that the, the secret negotiations going on behind people's backs and that he would prefer to be in public that everybody knew what was going on. That was his justification for what he did. Okay. But like De Valera, for example, um, made a public announcement at that time from America that Father O'Flanagan was speaking in his own right mm. as, um, as a leader, but he wasn't speaking for Sinn Féin. They were all very clear. Even though he was vice president of Sinn Féin at the yeah, time. Yeah. So like I say, that kind of showed that Stephen Collins certainly, he, I mean, he wouldn't have been into the escalation of violence. That's what you, you get from the essay he wrote. Yeah. sent over by De Valera then he had a couple of meetings with Lloyd George and yeah. he also had a couple of meetings with Lord Carson as well, and Craig he did yeah in Dublin so yeah. none, of, none of them actually particularly enjoyed the British politicians dealing with De Valera where they actually said that Father Fanning was somebody he could deal with he was a okay. straight talker Lloyd George was compelled to treat with the rebels although he didn't treat with them until he had already carried out the partition of Ireland without the consent of a single Irish political party. He had lied to the Irish people by saying that partition was only a temporary expedient. Well, he was sent to America first of all. Okay. Well, that, was, that was in the lead up to the treaty. Mm. Um, so when well, you had the ceasefire, was that to get him out of harm's way though? In terms of there's like Paul Patrick, there's, there's an element of that. They were all kind of wary of him and afraid of what he might say because he was a loose cannon. Basically. Yeah. So Father Flanagan was sent over. Michael Collins queried O'Flanagan going. He didn't want him sent. Whereas De Valera was adamant that he was going. So okay. you do certainly get a sense afterwards with hindsight that De Valera was kind of it's like a game of chess. Yeah. Put in certain characters in certain places. Yeah. So Flanagan and Schellig, um, mm. who was the MP for Louth, I believe, at the yeah. time, yeah. back um, 100 years ago, the two of them were sent off together. Father O'Flanagan's fears about Collins and Griffith were realised. In O'Flanagan's eyes, Collins and Griffith not merely signed without the consent of the cabinet but supported and indeed urged on and finally directed by the British Imperial Government, they split the cabinet, the doll and the country in their mad effort to hack their way through to success. You yeah, um, the treaty is uh, exactly a year after Father O'Flanagan got in trouble for sending a telegram to Lloyd George. Collins was over, the treaty was signed. Mm. And I heaved a sigh and said goodbye to dear old Skibbery. Father O'Flanagan has said, I spent the whole of the year 1922 in the United States, addressing meetings organised by Irish Republican societies there. It was a speaking tour, so they would go and they would give lectures like in Washington and then they would pass around the hat and they would raise money for the Republicans. But the whole thing was splitting back home. Mm. My original commission was still in force. While Arthur Griffith was president of the Irish Republic from January till August 1922, neither he nor any member of his government ever sent me any communication or asked me in any way to desist from my activities. 
I was still doing the work which I was commissioned to do by the cabinet of a united doll. At the time of the general election in June, it became clear to the English cabinet and their supporters in Ireland that they were unable to establish the free state government by constitutional means. Then they started to establish a Mussolini free state by force of arms. Michael Collins dropped the pretense that he was keeping the Irish Republic in existence until the vote of the people decided to abolish it. Within two months, Arthur Griffith died and Collins was killed in a skirmish. And uh, the civil war took place while Flanagan was here. He was gone for three years, three and a half years, so he was here for the War of Independence, but he was absent for the civil war. So he missed the entire civil war? He missed the civil war. He came back in 1924. In terms of his time in Australia... Um, oh yes, this is what happened. So he was sent off as a Republican envoy and a fundraiser. Mm. Then he was sent to Australia yeah. um, again to canvas or to campaign for Republicans. And so they were making speeches. And at this stage, I think, maybe when he was in Australia, I think the Civil War was still going on. Mm. And um, basically, um, the Free State government was um, recommending that the Australian government have him silenced, that he was... Um, rogue element. So I think he was in Australia for a couple of months, but I think he spent nearly two months incarcerated in Australia. Right. So they made a speech himself and Skellig and um, they talked an awful lot about uh, the orange card or Freemasons. Mm. And you know, again, when you research um, the RIC, you constantly come across references to the Freemasons mm. and the orange order. Yeah. The thing that in his time in Australia that he referred to again and again was that they were running into Freemasons. They were being blocked by Freemasons or, or Orange Lodges. And then nice. Lodges and Freemasons again. Yeah. I mean, the Orange Lodges basically are a branch of Freemasons. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A, a section of it. So, so that was one of the problems he had in Australia. So anyway, um, for making seditious speeches, um, they were incarcerated in Botany Bay. Okay. And they did something like, I think, eight weeks in prison in Australia. And they were extradited. They were kicked out of the country after eight weeks. Okay. Father Flanagan um, defended himself in Australia. He was his own legal counsel. Okay. And I don't know if that did him any good or not, but again, I have a huge amount of newspaper articles. It okay. got a huge amount of newspaper coverage at the time. He was um, sent out of Australia, and there is actually a thesis somebody has done, and he's partly responsible for the extreme <coughs> kind of laws that came in in Australia mm. um, for foreign nationals coming in or okay. you know the um, immigration laws in Australia were tightened up yeah. at that time. And the whole landscape over here changed like you know so when Father Flanagan finally did come back to Ireland after he, it was almost an unrecognisable country. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And a lot of people he knew would have died. Yeah. Some personal friend of like the O'Reilly, he had had Tory Pierce up to Sligo in 1904, I think, okay. to judge competitions in the fest. So he'd yeah. known Pierce since that time. He'd known Griffith since 1904, 1905. Wow. So he was he was well known to all of these people who were involved. Cahill Brewer and himself were great friends. Right. Huge friends. Like Cahill Brewer was a big, big fan of Father Flanagan's. I think they tried to come back to Europe and they were sent back to America again for another year or 18 months so I think he came back to Ireland in 1924 or 1925 mm. his mother died that time and he was called back because there was elections coming up again and Sinn Féin were going to contest them mm. but, and a Flanagan came back I think he was fairly horrified at the state of the country he came back mm. I mean I think in 1924 there was a mini famine there was yeah, yeah. in Ireland I think yeah. there were some children starved I mean you had the free state setting up mm. you know they started to use the workhouses or mm. You, know, you have the start of all this, the mother, baby, yeah. and all that stuff. So he wasn't impressed with the Ireland he came back, and I think what he said was, um, 
they've changed the sign over the door and you compare Ireland to a shop, but they're still selling the same old shoddy produce inside. Right. So that's what he basically said the free state was. It? And that happened in this community, like, you know, again, uh, anybody who had been involved in the Republican movement yeah. had a very, very hard time in the Couldn't 20s. get work or... Couldn't get work or yeah. was kind of socially ostracised at that time. And this was around the time he started talking about the Pope being no friend to Irish Catholics yeah. and that the Catholic Church was basically in the hand of the British government and always had been. Yeah. And this is when he started going back to his historical allusions to the Popes, like handing Ireland to the Normans or to, yeah. <coughs> to Henry VIII. So he started to become very unpopular and even within Sinn Féin, um, he was too hot to handle. You know, yeah. He became kind of nearly more rabid, I suppose, as he yeah. got older. Yeah. And so he was muzzled um, in 1925. He was not allowed to function as a priest. Um, seemingly when he was traveling in the States in that, he had he had vestments with him and, and yeah. Skellig at his graveside oration talked about serving mass with him on boats and things. So he was banned from saying mass to people. And that seems to be how they got to him because as I mentioned to you earlier, he had a vocation. Yeah, which yeah. He needed to be yeah. a priest and dealing with people. So anyway, in the late 1920s, the Ordnance Survey letters were all this information that was collected yeah. in Ireland in the 1830s, the late 1830s. Okay. It's folklore, it's archaeology, it's place names, it's townland names, it's all this information. Yeah, yeah. And it's an Ordnance Survey. This is something I hadn't realised. It was a, it, When you hear the name an Ordnance Survey, it's something, so what's that about? What they were doing was, after the 1798 and 1803 rebellions, they were um, surveying Ireland for gun emplacements, so it was to make sure that there would be another invasion that Ireland would be threatened. So they actually surveyed the country. Nice. But while they were doing it, was a military survey. But yeah. while they were doing it, they collected all the folklore. In the late 1920s, how they're planning and spent two years working on the Ordnance Survey letter. So they got the original handwritten transcripts. Yeah. And he had a team of four, I think he had two secretaries and a researcher. And they were in the National Library for two years, so they typed up. So this is one of the original typescripts. I think it's County Clare. Right. So that's all that information taken from handwritten notes, and it's all typed up. So it's wow. all townland. Every townland in County Clare is in this. So he raised the money to do that in America. Right. To that typing of that. And he had all this information placed in Irish universities. A copy of each of these went to each university and he had them placed in foreign universities as well. To preserve his like, yeah. preserve all this information. So that even if he had done nothing else with his life, he that's said, something like the survey. And archaeologists will tell you that that's a huge yeah. that, that's still used today. You know, Sinn Fein in the in the twenties and thirties, they were very bound by rules yeah. and they were very inflexible and that's why they didn't go anywhere to win any elections. That's mm. why never Valera left. Yeah, yeah. Because Evelera was never going to get into, he was never going to get his hands on any power yeah. if he stuck with Sinn Féin. And there was a motion in 1926 that Valera tried to change the Sinn Féin constitution or he tried to amend the constitution and Father Flanagan actually stood up to him and de Valera was defeated in a vote by about five or six votes. Yes. And that was really the, the straw. That was when de Valera left Sinn Féin then right. and that found Fianna Fáil. Father O'Flanagan remained with Sinn Féin after the departure of de Valera in 1926, who went on to form Fianna Fáil. O'Flanagan served as president of the organisation of Sinn Féin from 1933 to 1935. Sinn Féin was then in an ultra-abstentionist phase, and O'Flanagan was expelled in 1936 because he participated with members of other political parties in a radio broadcast commemorating the first doll. Well, he was banned from practicing as a priest for, I suppose, 15 years. And then when Archbishop McQuaid um, in Dublin was, well, he was, he was living in Dublin. He had no parish, he had no mm. place he was attached to. So towards the end of his life, he became, he became, when you look at the picture of him, you can see he was quite unwell in the mm. last few years of his yeah. life. He got very involved in the Spanish Civil War yeah. in 1937. Yeah. And he was one of the only um, Catholic Irish priests, I mean, to a man, the um, the Irish Catholics went with the fascists in Spain. So he was the only one who actually stood up for the Republicans. Yeah. He made a fact-finding trip to Spain and he was horrified by what he saw. So he actually went to America and he went on a fundraising trip to raise money for the 
Spanish Republicans during the Spanish Civil War. Okay. And he made speeches about that. So that was the, the 1937 and 1938. And then he met the Irish Brigade, Frank Ryan and them, when they came back from fighting in Spain. Yeah. He actually met them and he gave an oration in Dublin. Nice. And he presented them with a banner that was painted for them as well. Wow. Um, so they had great respect for him. There's a, a radio clip again of, of Frank Ryan being interviewed and, and talking about when they came back from Spain, Father Flanagan meeting them. And, um, there's a, about there's a, only a very small crew of them came back. Yeah. So basically, the church forgave him. I think in 1938 or 1939, um, somebody they approached Archbishop McQuaid, and they had him reinstated as a priest. Okay. And, um, during the 1930s, he was given a job by the Free State again by the educational um, side of things. So he was commissioned to write county histories. Okay. So there was one done for each county. I think they had eight done by the time he died. Yeah. In 1942. So. Tell us about uh, Father uh, Flanagan's side career as an inventor. Well, uh, uh, when you look at Father Michael Flanagan, you look at the variety of things he got involved in, whether that was revolution, whether that was involvement with the unions, uh, whether that was involvement with the turf cutters, or in a rather eccentric way, his invention of Spakely Snava, which are swimming goggles, which he patented and presented at a fair. I think it shows that uh, when Father Michael Flanagan got up in the morning, he didn't settle for the way things were. He saw that it was the job of humanity to change things and to improve things. And in some cases, you'll get ridiculed for doing that, because to change things is to be different and to be a first. But we need people like him, because if man, when he was in the cave, happy and warm, decided he was never going to, virtu uh, to venture much further from the cave, we wouldn't have got very far. Father Michael O'Flanagan is one of those people who would have ventured a long way from the cave and made life better for everyone else. <coughs> he sold them um, to fundraise for himself because he had no income as a priest, so he mm. made his own money. So he went to America and he gave lecture tours about Irish history and archaeology and different subjects. He had pamphlets printed up and mm. he would go over and he would go on a lecture tour in the States for mm. the summer. came back to Cliffney, I believe, a few times to visit the people and he kept in touch with the people by letter. Right. And actually, the, the, the very important letter that was hanging in a house, nobody knew about it until we started up at the centenary anniversary of, of, of uh, emerged to the bog in, on, on the anniversary of the day that he'd done it on the 29th of June. And, uh, we had it just in time for the wee booklet that we printed. He died of stomach cancer, was it? He died of stomach cancer in 1942 and again, didn't know much about his end yeah. until there just last August was his 75th anniversary. Yeah. So he died on the 7th of August, I think was six days short of his 66th birthday. And he had a kind of a history of illness, I think, from maybe his lifestyle, all the travelling and maybe not eating well and that. And I um, think we were talking last night about how he had to go and convalesce a few times after yeah. some of the elections or after, I think every now and then he went in for two weeks into a nursing home to convalesce. But basically he had um, stomach complaints and uh, he died of stomach cancer. He died in a nursing home, I think, um, in Dublin. So we went up to Glasnevin for his 75th anniversary and we met um, Seamus Fitzpatrick, who met Father O'Flanagan in the nursing home shortly before he died. And his father was Sean Fitzpatrick, who was a great friend of Father O'Flanagan. So Sean Fitzpatrick was given the job of organising the funeral. So he got a stake funeral and it was attended by De Valera. And he was laid out in City Hall, which again was where he'd made the speech for O'Donovan Rossa. Mm. Um, and I think 21,000 people came to pay their respects to him. Mm.
Seamus came to a realization that um, that the music was was fading as well in Mullock Moor, where I come from. Almost every house you would go to back in my father's time, in, in, in the time of the last generation, you would be accordion players, would be fiddle players, people would play the mouth harp, and they would play the, the, the Jews harp, as it was called, or the trump. And all that had died out. I mean, you, you could not go into a house in Mullaghmore at the present time and find anybody playing. So we decided that we'd start a session in Tiffany. It was just a conversation that happened in a car. We got on to uh, Tommy Collis was one of the people that we got on to, and some of the musicians that we knew. And we decided, you know, to, to light a fire, even though it would be a small one, to to, to try to bring the music back into into uh, into our particular area, which we would say is North Sligo. And what better name to pick than Father Michael of Lanigan? Yeah. Other names were discussed, but we decided to name the branch after Father Michael, and. Uh, uh, to, to give him some honour, even. Mm -hmm. So I remember at one point in time saying to the, the lads, look, this isn't really going that well. Um, we're having trouble getting musicians in and we, we don't seem to be spreading the faith as we thought we would. Yeah. So do, is there any point in going on? So Seamus McGowan's answer to me, and I, I remember it because with the, at times when you're scraping the bottom, you will always remember things that happened or things that were said. And Seamus, I remember, said to me, he said, look at Joe, he says, don't you worry about it. The only time you have to worry about it is when we stop coming. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I kept up on that and yeah. we continued on and uh, we had our ups and downs and um, that was the spark that was made so many years ago, probably about 1982. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to see that, uh, that you're here and that uh, Father Michael's fame will be recognised not only here but in other places as well. Thank you. Uh, the relevance that he had then and the relevance that he had today is that he sent out the message uh, over a century or a century ago that you don't necessarily have to do what the state tells you to do. If you believe that it isn't in the, in the interests of the general public, then you should stand up and fight against it. And at a series of public meetings that myself and the Turf Cutters and Contractors Association held around the country, 96 of them in total, we used the words of Father Michael O'Flanagan at the end of each meeting to inspire people to get up and fight. And his words were that we have been quiet for too long, we have been lied to for too long, and I added my bit in at the end, we must stand up and fight, we must rise up now, and we must be no longer lied to in the future, and we must be, not be quiet into the future. And that seemed to inspire people at those meetings, because people had many experiences of their A&Es being closed, many experiences of fights that they'd taken on being lost. And for people to hear about someone who took on the state and took on the church in a time when it was even more dangerous to do it, it inspired people to go out and fight, and helped us win that fight. So his relevance to nowadays is uh, just as strong as ever. But I suppose it's the job of people like myself and the do job of documentary makers to make sure that he is never forgotten.